Guildhall. Hello. So happy to have you here. Um, tonight is being hosted by Eric Fischel, who is a member of the Guildhall Board of Trustees. He's also the president of the Guildhall Academy of the Arts. And I think of this as a kind of three-part okay. series that Eric will be hosting on Art and Artists today. Um, the other two are coming up on July 20th, and that's called Art as Ecosystem. We'll have Glenn Furman here, um, Rick Lowe of Project Row Houses, um, and Dorothy Lichtenstein. And then on August 24th, we'll have the Halls of the Hall Foundation and Christy McClear, formerly of the Rauschenberg Foundation. Um, so we're really thrilled that Eric has put these conversations together for us. I'll tell you a little bit about um, Frederick Tutton, who will be coming out with Eric in just a moment. He studied at City College of New York, um, went on to get a degree in, um, or went on to study pre-Columbian art history in Mexico, uh, traveled throughout Brazil and taught um, on Brazilian film, wrote on Brazilian film. He then went to uh, get his PhD in American uh, 19th century literature at NYU, um, and later uh, co-founded the creative writing program, the graduate program at City College, um, and has done many, many, many other things. He's a novelist. He's written uh, short stories and essays, written on artists like John Baldessari, um, David Sally, Eric Fischel, was a close associate of Roy Lichtenstein, um, and so much more. So he's going to be talking to Eric about his recent memoir, My Young Life. Eric Fischel is probably one of the most renowned uh, figurative painters alive today. Um, he studied at the California Institute of Arts and then went on to teach at Nova Scotia College of Arts and Design. Um, and uh, he moved to New York in 1978. Um, his work has been shown uh, globally in one-person exhibitions. He's in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Phil Tall. <laughs> and we're just thrilled to have them here tonight. And I have written on my hand, there's a book signing, following with Frederick Tutton in the lobby. Please welcome Eric Fischel and Frederick Tutton. Treat him as though I don't even know this guy. 
so I hope that's okay. I wish you wouldn't do that. I wish you wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let me, let me start with this uh, uh, point, which is that... Uh, Can I interrupt you first? Yeah. The book doesn't go from zero to 24. I would presume I was an embryo or, or just... <laughs> You know, it's, it, it actually starts from about 10. Okay. Yeah. Just, just to get it straight. <laughs> but I love the facts of uh, Ryder. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm just going to say uh, uh, that Anais Nin wrote in one of her diaries that Arabs do not respect the man who unveils his thoughts. The intelligence of a Persian person is measured by his ability to elude direct questions. So with this in mind, we're going to see how intelligent Fred is. Anayas Nin. Anayas Nin, yes. I read when there was a moment when everyone was reading her. She was very passionately read. Yeah. Because there's a whole world of her and Henry Miller and uh, they grew up around with the Paris crowd and all that stuff. It was very exciting, you know, how groups make, whatever the work, quality of the work, I mean, the work could be just mediocre, but if the group is interesting, then there's a kind of reputation that goes well beyond the, the work yeah. itself. Yeah. A lot of, well, I, I was very uh, moved. I read all of her uh, diaries. I was totally moved yeah. by it. And when I saw her live in Chicago in like 1972, oh. I thought I'd seen a goddess or something. I was so in love. You're so with easily her. impressed. I know. <laughs> but if you saw her image, she, she had flame red hair, pale, pale skin, a purple long uh, scarf, and just a silhouette of black uh, dress. It was fantastic. You've aroused me very much about this. <laughs> <laughs> you should be the writer. That's I'm going right. to uh, start with my. First question. <laughs> uh, let me just say that in the uh, uh, Adventures of Mao uh, on the Long March, you wrote this. I, I think probably it was for the republishing of the thing. You wrote this about. This you is said my first novel we're talking about. this is your first novel. Radical. It's it's what put you on the map, right? <laughs> And, and, very small country. and you wrote, uh, <laughs> I, I did not want my first novel oh. to trade in the confidences of an unhappy childhood or to be a tale well told, people with colorful characters larded with easily prized sentiment. I was sure I did not want to be the 19th century novel yet once again. Fifty years later, you've written a wonderful and moving memoir, a coming-of-age saga, that takes us from your birth, or 10 years old, uh, to 24. And you talk about your immigrant parent family, uh, your, your powerful grandmother, your suffering, long-suffering mother, your father who abandoned you at 11, and your first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I lost count, uh, love affairs, uh, from grade school to, uh, to young women. So can you talk to... Grade school would be young women. <laughs> can, can you talk to us about the arc of your writing life that begins with your breakthrough postmodern novel and then moves to a coming of, uh, uh, to coming to embrace the romanticism that's rooted in it? century. Ultimately, you've written what you first vowed not to write, which is a memoir full of confidences of an unhappy childhood. Well, of a childhood. I'm old because I'm happy. There are some moments that are not. Well, I know what you're saying. You're saying, why don't I stop oh, my right. first book? Uh, my uh, uh, is it on? Is, is, uh, is my on? Why did I start off my first novel, The Adventures of Mal in the Long March, which was really a, a, a radical novel in structure. Uh, and I was deliberate about that. I wanted to make a novel that didn't seem like anyone had written it. That it was a kind of strange appearance. It had a kind of uh, manifestation, but there was no author behind it. I wanted that very much. A lot of it had to do with the moment. The kind of people who were making art, mostly mostly making art at the time, including Warhol, including Roy Lichtenstein, 
where the work seems so completely divorced from physical contact. But I wanted that. I thought, I don't want to do my first book to be a blabbering book about how I grew up in such a place and the Bronx childhood. And I, thought, I thought at the time I was writing that, I thought that was a sign of, of mediocrity, a sign of weakness, a sign of uh, superficiality. And it, I also thought it was too easy that to trade in the confidences of childhood and the rest was too easy. I also had uh, the feeling I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to break away. I wanted to break away from the novel. I wanted to break away from the structure of the novel. I wanted to make it something very, very different. And in a way, I think I succeeded by having uh, a narrative spine of the Mao Tung Tong Long March, an intercut with parodies, intercut with quotations. I just threw, I threw, here's, a, I'll, take, I'll make a parenthesis. When I was a kid, I was about 19, I had a wonderful, I hope you read the novel, the, the book, the memoir, just for the parts to do with these people I'm talking about. There was a man called Leonard Ehrlich. He was my writing teacher at City College. He was a wonderful man. He's, he's, he was a, a wonderful man. At 25, he had became famous at 25 for one novel called God's Angry Man. Overnight, he, uh, the New York Times review of it said basically, our American novelist has come, at, uh, come of age, and we're here now. It was an extraordinary, out of nowhere. Well, we became friends, and uh, the, the second parenthesis is that he could not finish a second novel. The tragedy of his life, the tragedy and sorrow of his life, he went around haunted by the fact that he could not finish a second book. He felt he was a failure, and he carried that everywhere. He was very kind to his students, including me, and one day he brought me to what is astonishing because I, you know, I came from the Bronx to go to the Upper West Side. These huge three bedroom apartments with windows facing everywhere. <laughs> and I, I, it was a kind of thing, you know, we never knew about this. How would you know about it when you're a kid in the Bronx? Right? I mean, most kids. You know, it was sophisticated. There were people who were serving drinks and there was uh, music and, there was, and, and, and adults, all kinds of adults. He invited some of his choice students, better students, people in the Bronx. And there was a guy there, a writer, Albert Halper. Now, no one knows who he is. All these people have forgotten. Part of why I wanted to do this memoir, part of why I wanted to do it now, was I wanted to have the memory of these people not lost, these interesting people. I don't want them forgotten, including my family, including people who helped me along the way. This man, Albert Halper, won a novel was called, uh, <clears throat> called Union Square. He was part of the proletarian novel period of the 30s. He was a big kind of guy, and a, kind of like a longshoreman kind of guy. He said, uh, he said Lenny, Lenny says you want, you're writing a novel, right, kid? And I said, yeah, I'm writing a novel. Well, throw everything into it. The kitchen sink. It's your first book. No one's looking over your shoulder. Do whatever you want. And I thought, that was a fantastic license. Do whatever you want. And so I just made this crazy book of quotations. There's a section where Mao Zedong is addressing his soldiers at night after a very long march, they're exhausted. And he begins to talk to them to sort of bolster their confidence for what's ahead. And it's a whole speech I took from Walter Payton's studies in the Renaissance. It's about aesthetics. So I thought, what an incredible idea that a creature can board battle torn by the tired soldiers. A, a, a kind of 1890s book of meditation on Beauty and Aesthetics. That's the crazy book it was. That was a long time ago. I was 35 when I published it. Uh, it had some success. In fact, it did. I was astonished how much so, because no one wanted to publish it. But it's usually the case with my books. But no one wanted to publish it. No one. It was out of control. There was no way. And by the way, I'm glad you raised this now, because I want to bring it back to something else. That book came into life, mostly because of Roy Lichtenstein, who I had been friends with at the time, and I said, asked, I said, Roy, no one wants to publish this book. I'm going to publish it myself. I had this crazy idea. I was going to go to Gibraltar. I had never been out of Europe. I had never been to Europe by that time. But I don't know why Gibraltar. I knew, I knew they published books on the cheap there. So I'd go to Gibraltar and get it published, and Roy would do the jacket cover for me. And Roy, Roy, Roy without even asking, said, yeah, I'll do it. And once we had Roy's approval, then somehow it got into the world that what he was going to do if he, a, a jacket cover, and maybe he would do a special edition so they can make money from it. And that's how the book got done, by this very small, 
sort of semi-porno press. It wasn't even Olympia, we were thinking here of Olympia press, it was some kind of silly little goofy, goofy press that published those soft porn stuff, and they did the book. That was the first book. That's how the book came out. It was really Roy's help. I've never, never found that book published, ever. Not then or today. I'm, stru I'm struck by uh, something you said. Only one thing that you said. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is, you were saying that you wanted to remember yeah. these people. Yeah. Do you think that there are literary forms that cannot uh, contain memory? That's a good question. It's such a highfalutin question. <laughs> I'm working all hard to impress this crowd. <laughs> They just come from the beach, they want to have fun. <laughs> you know, um, I don't even know what's the question. Is there, or, 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 does all literature contain memory? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you were talking about uh, these people that meant so much to you in your lives that were affecting you, that you wanted to remember the, the, the thing that was so essential about them. I wanted them to be remembered. You want them to remembered. be remembered. And I was wondering if, if there is literary forms that would not allow that that depth of uh, feeling to be uh, transmitted through the stylistic thing, I guess, what I'm saying. Gee, I don't know. I mean, in the sense that even a book that seems to be written by no one, like I thought the Mao was trying to be, is always the impress. You can't, you can't hide the period, you can't hide the writer behind it in some way. It's always there somehow. Yeah. It's always going to be there. But I, I want to go back to this again. I want to go back to why this memoir is so important to me. Uh, John uh, Leonard Ehrlich was one of those people, an incredible character. I mean, uh, I, I can't let go of this story. It was, so, it was so moving to me, his life. One day, to go back again, he had not published a second novel. He saw teaching at City College. He had an independent means. He had a lot of money, but he had some money. He never had to really teach or do anything. He could just write if he wanted to. He was free. And, he would always move apartments. He, had, he could go, in those days you could get like a three bedroom apartment, the upper west side, for, but now it would seem ridiculous, like nothing. But he was able to do it with our professor's salary, but the salary wasn't the important thing. And he had these apartments, huge apartments. I don't know how he came and furnished them. And then he would leave after six or seven months because he would hear someone somewhere knocking on a pipe and it would disturb his equilibrium, it would disturb his serenity, and he had to go somewhere else. He always go somewhere else. He was always going to Yaddo, for example. He had a, was a permanent residency upstate New York in Sarah. He, he was in Yaddo all the time. And he, I found out later, he was also the lover of the person who ran Yaddo. So I guess that was one of the things. One day, he said to me, uh, we had lunch. And he said to me, come, I, you want to come over? I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Fred. I went over to the huge apartment where he had all his parties. And he comes back with a box. And one of those sort of talks you open up, and there was a manuscript, typewritten, of course, before the computer. It's his second novel. He takes it out and shows it to me. He says, it's all done but the last chapter. He has another box. He opens it up. It's the third novel. All done but the last chapter. You cannot make this up. And I, and I said, what's happening with you? But I couldn't, I basically couldn't even call him any. I never knew a professor, professor Earl. He said, I, I can't finish Fred. I was too young, I was 19, I was too young and too naive and too maybe too timid to say, dictate it. Do something. Do something. Don't, you have it. What's wrong? I couldn't speak to him that way, of course. And then he said, could you read a few pages? And I remember reading one of the, the first four or five pages there with him. And it was beautiful. It was about a man walking in New York City, and he hear, and he wonder, he's hearing the fire engine, then he hears somewhere a bell from a church, and then he hears all these sounds, he think it's all auditory. And then you begin to realize it's auditory because the man is a composer and a musician. So he's very alert to sounds of the city alert. It was kind of beautiful and moving. Um, now those those uh, volumes, those two volumes are, uh, in the, I think they're in the Bird collection at the New York Public Library, where all this stuff, all his papers appear. I wanted him not to be forgotten. I wanted his way of living, what he was thinking about it, what he suffered not to be forgotten. And on another case in point, may I just continue on this, another case in point is this. When I was a kid, uh, 
I'm always a kid, but when I was a real kid, young kid, I was about 15, I wanted to drop out of, I dropped out of high school. Because I had a fantastic idea that I was going to be a painter, uh, you know, a painter. <laughs> and go to Paris, and be a painter in Paris, where I would get a kind of, I get shown the de Bolle in the studio, up above, above a cafe, and I'd paint, and then eventually I would meet some beautiful young woman who become my model and my muse and my lover. And that all this would be done because uh, they love Americans. They love American people. <laughs> I got this idea from the film American in, pa Amer an American in Paris with Gene Kelly and Leslie Trump. I remember going to see it at the, I remember going to see it at the, the famous uh, uh, the theater at the, uh, uh, the Champs Elysees. The Chance of the of the Bronx, which was a uh, grand compost. <laughs> the, 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 Lois, the Lois Paradise. It was incredible. The Lois Paradise was, was, was a palace. I mean, you looked up at little stars blinking above. It was like a paradise. American in Paris. I took the bus. I heard about it. I went all the way from Pelham Parkway to the Grand Conquest, and I went to see American in Paris. I actually wanted to see it twice, but I was afraid my mother would worry where, where I'd been. So I, I, I only saw one and a half times. But it convinced that you could go to Paris and then live like an artist. And it was living like an artist that meant the most and most and most to me. So I dropped out of high school, but barely the legal age, my mother signed the papers. We had no money. I had, I, I don't want, that's why I didn't want to talk about the first, why I didn't want to do that in the first, but I didn't want to talk about poverty. And that's an old theme now. Everyone was poor. I used to be poor. Now no one's poor. But everyone was poor in my time. Well, a lot of poor people in my time was put that way. And I was, one, I was among them. But I didn't want to write about that. We had no money. It was in terrible, sad conditions. My mother was heartbroken. My father left, and she never got over it. Never, never got over it. Never until she died. Never. Waiting for him to come back. She's a Sicilian. She's, she's a Sicilian. It's a Sicilian. I asked her once, but mom, can't you be realistic about this? He's not going to come back. She said, he will. It's my destiny. It's a Sicilian destiny. <laughs> Very strange people. Let me pick up on the way you're talking John, about it in terms of... John Resco. Please let me finish about John Resco. John Resco. You're going you're to recite the whole book. <laughs> okay, I'll stop right there. I'll stop. We, can get to, we can get to Resco yeah, okay. in this. And but I'm we'll right. picking up on your yeah. passion for um, uh, Paris and being a, an artist. Uh, in Paris and stuff, which meant so much to you that, you know, you you always read as a child, and yet you're, you have this thing about painting. And uh, I, I, in, the, in your colorful drawings, there's an ease of animation that uh, we're looking at oh, here. Sir, what, what yeah. the drawings? Yeah. Uh, an ease of animation that depends less on the kind of detail that you have in your novels, and more on fluid, confident lines uh, that depict with delight and humor simple exchanges between characters. Uh, often your people are open mouthed as if talking to each other. I don't know if you've noticed this that. This is my book, my book, my no, fiction. This is your drawings. drawings here. Would you write the catalog essay for me? Uh, <laughs> anyway, my question is because they're, they're often playful, innocent, immediate, and unlabored. Can you talk a bit about how you see the difference between writing and, uh, and drawing, painting. That's so an interesting question because I, I there to me, such singularly different operations. Um, when I'm writing, this is the when I, when I write, which is not always consistently. Uh, I'm sort of, you know, committed all the time to doing it, and then I stop for a long time. I go back and do it a long time. Uh, it's a different kind of thinking. It's a different kind of thinking. It just is. You, you, when you're writing, at least when I'm writing, I actually live with the characters. I actually do live with them. I sometimes dream about them. They talk to me in dreams. That sounds very far-fetched and very surreal, but it's really true. I hear conversations that I had any in the book, and I, I get up in the morning, I want to write down what they said, things like that. Uh, and it's a different thing. I am, it's a different kind of immersion. It's an immersion when you're writing. If you're really writing well, if you're really writing, I don't want to sound like Henry when you're writing well, but you know, when you're writing well, you're just in the dream of it. It's a full-time occupation. So even in your nighttime life, in your day and your talking life, 
It's consistently there. You're living that life as a rule, writing those seeds, right? writing those seeds, writing those seeds, imagining, imagining, imagining. Right? But, the, but the drawing for me, you know, I've been drawing for 20 years, and again, I want to go back to this again, because I, saw, I, I gave up the idea of becoming a visual artist when I was, after I went to the Art Students League, and they humiliated me, one person did so badly that I never went back again. Uh, I, mean, I was really hurt. I mean, that's why I think, pedagogically speaking, it's not a good policy to try to hurt students by you know, demeaning their work and making them think that by doing that, they're going to be strong enough to come back and face the real world. That's just bullshit. That's just uh, sadism. It's not pedagogy. I never, I never, I just, I thought, I thought, I have to go back. Don't, don't let me stop. <laughs> I thought, if I want to be a real artist, I have to learn how to draw from the figure. And that, that's what that's the people I had known about had done. Picasso had done it. Matisse had done it. They had to always look, everyone had done it. Everyone, even, you know, everyone had done it. So I thought that's what I had to do. I had to learn to draw from the figure. I went to the Art Students League. I forgot one of this. Oh, I forgot the whole reason I'm saying this now. The difference between A well, and oh, so, so, <laughs> yeah, I, so, so uh, when I was doing the figure with the charcoal pad and all that stuff, the guy came over. His name was Ernest Feeney. Ernest Feeney, rotten hell. <laughs> he came over and he, he looked at my drawing and he said, what are those? I said, those are her feet. And he said, looking around, is she wearing galoshes? And some people tittered and the people were laughing a little bit and I felt so hurt. And then some people came over and said, he's just a jerk, don't mind him. You know, feet are very hard to do, hands and feet are very hard to do for, for, for an artist. But that sort of shook me up and then eventually I just gave up that until later on I began to make drawings. So it's the drawings we're talking about. The drawings have absorbed me in a way. I, I did it for a long, long time, very long time. Now maybe 15 years ago, I told Roy when he was like, I was making these drawings. And he said, and he was, he was so kind, he actually said, I'd like, I'd like to see them. I mean, who really cares about seeing you know, Amethyst's work? But he was kind enough to say yes. I showed him some drawings. And the thing that struck me was that two things. He, he really looked, he didn't just turn the book pages, he really, really looked. And then he said to one of them, Fred, this is really beautiful. And I was so taken aback. I said, well, you don't have to say that. I almost want to cry when I think about it. I said, you don't have to say that, boy. It's okay. No, no, it's really beautiful. Then he said, but I want to, may I say, make a suggestion? Your, your surface is uniform. Make your pencil, darken it here, push more and press there, put more pressure there, do some variation, take some chances. I never forgot that. And then I did more and more drawings. And then the last years, the last three or four years now, I've been a madman of drawing. I, I'm worried about it because I think, well, I ever write another book. I'm so captivated by it. I'm so smitten by it. I love the idea that this blank piece of paper, and all of a sudden, things appear, and colors come out of nowhere. It's magic to me, and I love it. I just love it, I've always loved it. But now I have a way to do it that makes me happy. I can feel strong about it and feel confident about it. I don't mean the consequence. I don't mean confident that it's good or bad. I mean confident that I have the right to do it, and confident that I can do it. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a show last March, uh, April. My first, uh, yeah, my first, an only solo show after all the years, after all the years from the Austin League to now, and my first show my drawing is in a little gallery called the Plant House Gallery. It's in the flower district, that's why it's called Plant House. It's, it's so off the track, it's so off the, but it's in Manhattan. You know, it's, I'm not in Brooklyn. <laughs> so I'm going to put it that way. Um, for me, that's a big thing. I mean, coming from the Bronx, to be able to have anything in Manhattan, to be in Manhattan already, just to stay in Manhattan. It's a great thing. I'm sure if some of you saw uh, Saturday Night Fever with Travolta. Do you remember how they would talk about going to the city? Mm -hmm. We're going to go to the city. You know, I dream of going to the city, getting an apartment to the city. Well, that's how I felt. Going to the city, going to the city. I'm going to, one day I'll go to the city. I either you go to the city or I'm going to go to Paris. I wasn't sure which one we go to. <laughs> uh, so the drawing show was important to me. and, and uh, uh, I'll send you all the announcements uh, for my next one in October because I'm very happy to have another show. I mean, uh, it, was bit, it was a bit of a success to, to the shock of the, the gallery owner. I was amazed by it, you know. A people would come by. But it was very nice. It went over very well. But the drawing thing is marvelous. 
the thing is marvelous. And I don't know if I can transfer that feeling of, of, to painting itself. It's a very different, as, I, as you feel well know. Mm -hmm. It's, and you know, I think this, I think anyone who wants to be an art critic, not an art historian, but art critic, they should be made to learn how to paint, to paint and draw, and see how difficult it is. And then, then talk, talk your talk. You know, it's easy to talk about paintings and make fun of them, or not like them, or like them. Try it and see what went into that painting, and then you'll be all humbled by your approach, I think, in the future, by any, for any of these people. I mean, my, my experience yeah. is that most uh, critics were art students. Nobody, nobody is born thinking, you know, I want to be an art critic. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot, of, a lot of editors are more, a lot of editors and uh, people were, all, were writing students or literary students or just things like that. Because it does, because you can know a lot about a thing, like you know a lot about fiction, you know a lot about novels, you know the history of it. But it doesn't mean you can write about it, write about them. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's, no, there's no correlation that I can see. But I, I, I'm, I'm smitten by the drawing enterprise. And sometimes, I, strangely enough, uh, since I'm a very avid t TV watcher, especially those great cables like Breaking Bad and The Sopranos, I mean, they're just magic. They're, just better, than, they're better than most writing today, most fiction today. They are much better. They're marvelous. They're brilliant. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I watch a lot of television. But the last, when I saw it, when I saw making a drawing, I find myself sometimes not watching the television at night, which is a strange thing for me. Not the news on it. I just want to make drawings. I, I can set two, three in the morning, and it's 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 it's, it's really an incredible occupation, preoccupation. Mm -hmm. Well, here's one thing about color. I see it, make a drawing, and I see I go away from it, and I think, don't do anything. Wait until the morning. Wait until the morning. Don't make any decisions right now. Don't be hasty. I actually talk to myself, yes. and, uh, and I wait until the morning, and then I can see. Oh, there, that little piece there, that needs some red. And I just like the whole thing. I just like the whole thing. I can imagine how you, you know, how you must feel, but, you know, wanting to paint all the time, all the time. No. <laughs> no. I mean, that's actually why I was asking the question, because the, the, the thing that you do can cause you the most, uh, you know, pain and, and uh, you know, just the, the doubt, problems, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I have activities that I do that are, you know, free of thought, that are my paintings. They're drawings, watercolors, whatever, oh. where you just do this other thing. I see. And I've, I've always felt like I have to somehow build my life towards that being the ultimate. Thing, rather than the, the laboring of the detail and the precision and the, you know, it's, it's been this kind of constant conflict with me. So I was curious. But there's hear. a different responsibility you have. I mean, you're a great artist. I, I, think, I think Eric is not to flatter him, you know. To feel free. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a, I was very lucky when I, I finally did get to Paris. And I actually still had to live in Paris for a while. I was very old by that time. In, in Paris, I wasn't 15 anymore. I had a wonderful time in Paris, wonderful life in Paris, wonderful friends in Paris. I really loved it. I almost never wanted to come back. But when I did, I, had, I was living way so differently. And I would start to read about these artists in America, these, these young artists in America, who made such a big splash. A big splash. Eric Fischel. David Sally, Ross Fletcher, all these people. I said, what a strange thing. I, I actually, I mean, I've said this before, so you don't want to be, I, I thought, these guys, are, these guys are ridiculous. They're going backwards. They're going back in time. We fought all those battles, the abstract expressionist painters, all those guys, to release us from figuration, to release us from the from contents of all, apparent content. And here they are, doing it all over again. What's wrong with them? When I got back, <clears throat> I was a book editor for Art Forum, and the editor said, uh, you know, uh, why don't you, here's some books, do you have, in mind, do you have anyone in mind who might review them? And I thought, perversely, David Sally, I'll just David Sally, the painter, to, to do it. I gave him the books, he did a review, which was astonishing, because he was so mean about one of the papers he was writing about. But we became friends, we became great friends. And then one day he said to me, you know, you should be Eric Fisher, you'll like him. 
And this opened up the whole world. Then I began to, I knew Eric. And, anyway, the long and short of it is, uh, my feeling about their work is, is paramount. I think it's paramount. They're great, and I think that each of them, have, in each way, in their own kind of painting, really have made something so important for us, so beautiful for us, above all. So, the, so uh, when I say go back, your, your, your problem is, when I say problem, not problem, <laughs> your, your, your issue may be that you, 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 you I'll, I'll go back again. Uh, when that Albert Halper said to me, no one's, looking over, no one's looking over your shoulder, throw everything in, even the kitchen sink, my liberty was that I, no one was looking over my shoulder, no one cared if I wrote a book, didn't write a book, no one cared, no one waiting for, the next book will come out, they're not going to like it, it was, I was free. I think when you're professional as you are, there's, a, there's some, something over your head, which is what's going to happen with the next show? People like to work. Well, there, there's, a, there's another kind of dimension to it. I don't think you're as free as you are when you're making something like for yourself in a way. What, what, was, what was your, your the time between the, uh, Mao and the next book? Uh, Mao was in 71, and then uh, 60, 16 years passed uh, rather quickly. Um, and the first and the second book, um, I, uh, I actually thought to myself, I actually said this to myself, did, did Leonard Ehrlich give you a curse? Were you cursed by Leonard Ehrlich never to finish a second book? I actually used to think that. What's going on here? You know, an interesting thing happened to him. The first book was well received, even critically. He had gone up by like that. He hated my work later, but he liked that. <laughs> he, he was miserable about my, my, last, uh, my last novel. As if I had not wished him happy birthday or something. Yeah, 16 years passed, but I was doing other things. I'd like, I'd like to apologize for my lapse of 16 years. I did a film with a marvelous, incredibly wonderful guy. He's not in the book because it's, it's later, called Andrzej Zulawski. Uh, the film is called Possession. <coughs> And you probably will, none of you probably have heard of it or know about it, but anyone over 25 is in love with it. They're out of their minds. I think it's a mediocre film. I think it's a crazy film, but it's a cult film. And people love this film. And Isabella Johnny is in it, the wonderful actress Isabella Johnny, Sam Neill. Uh, and Isabella Johnny won the, uh, the Cesar for that, and it's the equivalent of the American Academy of uh, American Academy uh, Prize. <coughs> so I wrote, I wrote the film with Zulas, and we did a second film together, which was, was uh, no one wanted to take, or actually it's more complicated than that. And I wrote, I wrote essays, mm. I, wrote, I wrote stuff, I was always writing, 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 but not a second book, but I was writing a second book. I said, that's the trick of it. It took 16 years for me to finish it. And it wasn't my second book published, it was my third book published. It was, it's called Tintin in the New World. And you may know, you may know some of you, this wonderful, I can't call them a comic strip, it sounds so, it means that this children's book comic, I guess it is, or bande dessinée, uh, a Tang Tang, who has a sidekick of an uh, older sea captain who's a total alcoholic. It's a strange idea that a young 12-year-old prepubescent sidekick is an old alcoholic, but he is, and a dog, Camilo, a little white, little snowy terror, terror, one of them. And these, these books are wonderful. These, these albums are just, if you don't know them, please. They're not just for your children, your kids, your grandchildren. They're just for you. They're, they're marvelous. They're beautifully done. So uh, I was writing this book about Tantan, a novel about Tantan, about him going away on another adventure, and the adventure was Machu Picchu. It's called Tintin and the New World. So he comes to the New World with his, with his dog and, his, and the sea captain, and he meets all the characters from Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. So it's a kind of strange encounter, the old world, the magic mountain world, and the Tintin world in, in, in South America. Did you, did you happen years. to uh, see in the paper the other day that, uh, I, I think it's in Italy, the, the government is making uh, this church redo a sacred uh, painting that had been retouched and in the retouching, they made the saint look like Tan Tan. Did anyone see that? I was the times yesterday. Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle said, Gaulle is more famous than I, but Tan Tan. Uh, 
it had actually been the public sector, but Tantan's well in France, no, no, in fact, Tantan was very famous too. Not in America, and I know why. I know why, exactly why. Because there's not enough violence. You know, now these kids have been raised on incredibly violent things. On, on, on movie, TV, or comic, or cartoons, and the tens of them violence. There was no violence. There was nothing. I mean, once in, in five albums, a gunshot appears. Or something. It's cerebral, it's beautiful, it's moving, it's touching, it's funny. Um, yeah, but that, that was it. So 16 years elapsed. I wrote another novel before I published another novel called Tadiana, a brief romance. It's about a French revolutionary, a real person. That was your third novel? That was the second novel. That was the second one. That was the second one. The third one was Tan Tan, but that was published after, but I had been, I've been working. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, the, um, the Tan Yen, a brief romance. One day I was, let me go back again. Sometimes when I'm teaching, uh, students wonder about, you know, what they're going to write about. And, uh, I guess, I guess the same thing would apply. What are you going to paint? What's, up, what's the subject matter? One day I was reading the Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, at the 11th edition, which was before 1914, which means that, that there's no water that ever happened. It's a strange kind of volume, but it's brilliant. A 35-page essay on prosody by Swinburne. I mean, it's extraordinary. You can probably get it for $3 now. It's on 15, 16 volumes. And I'm reading, I'm reading, and I see, come, see, I read this entry about a French, young French revolutionary, Jean Lambert Tallien. He was 19 when the revolution came. He was a, he became a printer's apprentice. He was learning how to make new printing and stuff like that. And he took it into his head at 19, by himself, to make these placards and post them around Paris, asking for the execution of the king. This is before the flight to Varan, it's before the king fled, before they were taken back, and before they were given a trial. They had not yet known what to do with the, you know, with the monarchy. They were thinking maybe constitutional monarchy, they weren't sure. He was asking for the death of the king. So when Robespierre and Marat and all the rest of them came into ascendancy, they saw this young kid as they, their kind of guy. And they, one of, they brought him into their fold, and they had him supervised, because he was actually a murderer at heart, had to supervise the executions of the aristocrats in Marseille. Now you can't make this up. He goes to the prison, he sees some people there, he sees a woman in the prison, he falls in love with her behind bars. She called herself Citizen Victim. She cut her hair like a punk haircut. She had one breast shown, naked breast shown. She was ready to be executed. And Tanya, this young kid, takes her out of the prison house living with her. And that's, that starts the whole cycle of how he gets his, her friends out of the prisons, how he, he turns basically against the revolution. It's an extraordinary thing what, what love will do to people. Uh, so uh, that's the second book. Yeah. But, yeah, okay. Uh, I went on too much about that. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll move on, shall I? <laughs> um, that, uh, let's see, I, I uh, as you know, I love your writing read almost all your books, and uh, uh, what I love about them is how visual and tactile your writing is. Uh, often you use color and shapes to, uh, to locate the reader in an experience that gives us both a palpable sense of place and an emotional condition. And uh, this made me think of a, a something Borges said about uh, how best not to dwell on the metaphor, but to feel its implications. He's so and, great. Uh, hmm? He's so great. Yeah. Wow, he's, he's just amazing. So uh, when I uh, I read, um, you know, in your in your memoir, I read things like my second year at Syracuse was grayer than my first. <laughs> Uh, it makes me wonder if you felt the same way as uh, what Borges was saying. About. Well, uh, color, color and atmosphere. Uh, uh, I'm laughing about the Syracuse business because uh, I'm sure I'll never be invited there to teach after what I said about it. Uh, I, I always have a way, I've always discovered, I found a way to cut to break my cut my bridges, what is it? Break my bridges or something like that. Burn, burn. burn my bridges. I burn it. I guess I burn them. You could cut it. <laughs> but when you said that the gray, you mentioned the word the gray of Syracuse. I don't know if you have been up there. 
in that place. It's not terrible, it was just terrible for me. But I remember the first first moment I saw it, it was gray. And I, I, can't, I, I think I arrived there um, <coughs> September 1st, and it started to snow. And it snowed until May 31st. <laughs> and, then, and it was gray or grayer. That, that was the two worlds. But gray, I mean, gray was a depressing color. Color, color. You know, color changes you. It can make you happy, it can make you sad. It really can do that to you. And you started one of your uh, uh, stories in portraits oh, my by, by saying, uh, the sky was briefly flat today. <laughs> I just thought that was the most amazing way of beginning a... Uh... Uh, well, I, I also realize now when you say this, how I use art references. For example, I talk about a, a sky that is Tiepolo blue. Mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of cloud. I call Tiepolo the biographer of the sky. And I said I call him that one, because he does his skies are so beautiful. But so is Poussin, Poussin skies, the, the blue is the blue. I wonder to myself, they must have used different pigments. They could not, you, I don't think that we have paint like that today, do we? They can make that kind of blue, or is it just time ages it, and time mellows it, and time does something to it? I mean, time, time changes the color, maybe that's what it is, maybe time does it. I, I think line. actually we have so many more colors than we they have, have that it's hard to get back to there. I just they had to grind them themselves, right? At least in the 18th, 17th century. Yeah. So, tell me what you want to ask before. Uh, we're going back to the beach. Well, talking about, you know, I, this, is a, a, this is a question from somebody, from me, who doesn't know anything about literature, okay? So I'm curious about this. You, uh, you, you wrote about seeing the, your dead father. Rex's corpse, yellowish, mummified, stiff as a laundry brick. In the background, an ashtray of dead cow. And you dismiss that piece of writing as purplish. <laughs> and I'm really curious why. I mean, what, what in I that? I told my own writing purplish. Yeah, you, you, you <laughs> in, in, your, in, the, in the memoir, you yeah. sort of dismiss yeah. it as like, you know, I wrote this purplish thing at yeah. the time. Yeah. But I, I guess I'm, so. I'm just curious. <laughs> well, I, I just think it's so vivid. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's, um, I put it, uh, schlocky. So it's too purple. To put it's too too much stuff. To put mummified and ashtray of dead camels, camels and mummified. Well, you know, dead I mean, camels, the camels and the cigarettes. I know. <laughs> that's what's so brilliant. Yeah, uh, maybe I like it. Maybe you maybe you it. Maybe, 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 I don't know. Uh, I'm very wary of overwriting. Uh, I guess that, that's true in, in art. I mean, when there's too much of it. When there's no room for the spectator or the reader to breathe into it, okay. uh, you've got to be some allowable space to let us come into the picture. Yeah. I mean, when it's too crowded, when it's too much, when it's too much, too ripe, too everything. No, no. You know, there's a painting that says on, well, maybe one of the late paintings, uh, certainly the watercolors, where there are actual spaces, like as if he had been finished it. It looks like, it looks, you think to yourself, what's the matter with the guy? Did he get tired? No, he didn't paint it. And that was deliberate. He wanted to leave the areas open. He wanted us to come to it. He wanted even the mystery of it. What would have been done? What would have choices would have been? Those things are miraculous to me. Those are the intelligences of an artist. Those are the shrewd, intelligent ploys of an artist that keep us alive in the work, keep us ever vivid in the work. So I'm, 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 emba I'm embarrassed by writers. I mean, some of them, uh, you know, very famous, very well-known writers that are contemporaries of mine. The writing is turgid. It's just, I don't know how anyone could read it. Maybe that's why no one wants to read it. I don't know. But I know I don't want to read it. I mean, long passages of description. You know, long, long, long stuff. And that you can feel that the writer is telling, telling the reader, you see what a writer I am? I'm a real writer. I'm, I'm going to write I'm gonna write this fucking story to death. And I'm going to like it. I'm such a great writer. I can't stand it. It makes me ill. Actually, it makes me sick. No, I, and I think that. Now I understand why I'd rather watch television most of the time. Because <laughs> it's, ter it's terrible. No one really cares, and it has no content anyway. There's no life lived in it. I don't feel life lived in most of the work I read. No, no not today. I don't feel it today. Um, there's a great, a great, one lesson about painting, there's a great 
Paris Review interview in 1955. It's been republished. You can go online and find the whole interview. With Georges Simenon. Now, Georges Simenon has always been thought of as a kind of, you know, third rate mystery writer, detective story writer, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it? Not thriller, you're not thriller, but you know, solve the case writer. And his famous, his, his famous, uh, his famous person is the commissioner, Magret. Uh, Magret, the movies made of Magret. And, and, let me tell you this, I came to the books very late, and the reason they were very late, I thought, well, he can't be a very important writer, he's just a mystery story writer, what a stupid idea. Because there are great writing in every genre, in every genre. You know, science writer, science fiction writing, uh, detective writer. A great writer is a great writer, period. So, I read this interview with Simenon, and they say to him, who are your influences? And you expect them to say, oh, you know, Tolstoy. Uh, you know, yeah, the, the more important the influence, the more important your own work seems to be. You know, you can't just say, you know, uh, some guy uh, wrote a mystery story. You say, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky's my big influence. No, no. He said, the impressions, the impressions for atmosphere. And then he said, and Cezanne. Cezanne can paint an apple in just three strokes. I thought, wow, that's what, that's what he does in his fiction in just a few brief sentences, tight, in the first paragraph, he gets you. You can't put the books down, you cannot. I, I'm so vivid about it, so excited about it, because I think to myself, how it changed me. The idea of like, what seems so corny, you know, when you're a kid, you see these matchbook things. How to become an artist, you, you, send, away, you send away a drawing, and you have a drawing school, you know what I mean? John Day. You know, what, what was it? Draw. You, you learn to draw stuff, like, you know. You, make, you show them the drawing, and if they like it, they'll tell you more how to do it better, and you have to keep paying for them. There's also things like how to, how to become a writer. And, that. How, and the only thing was, the first thing was how, your first sentence had a grip everyone. So it was things like, the door slammed, or uh, the gunshot rang out, or something, something like that. And I said, I said, I laugh at that. I said, oh, God, it's so corny. But I think, no, there are ways in which you can do it authentically and vividly. And Simenon does it. That's what I'm talking about. And the, the relationship with painting, to writing, my, my thoughts about it, in fact. You know, I, if I could just do that, but like he does, make, make something happen in three quick sentences. But have some, have some meaning, have some heft, have some texture, have some beauty in that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, over, I'm over, overheated about this, but I, 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 I encourage well, you to read Simenon. Why don't we, uh, uh, because we've been here yeah. for almost an hour, yeah. turn it uh, in terms of reason, dying of mortification. In, no, the, uh, in the audience. Uh, Would that be okay? I'm happy to, yeah. 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 Are there questions? Or did Fred answer yeah. every single one? You know what I did? I did exactly what I said I wasn't going to do about what I didn't want to see in painting. I crowded everything up in the canvas. There's no room for you to talk. There was a question there, Fred. Please. Can you speak so loud, please? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, should, I mentioned John Resco. Yeah. And uh, what do I want to talk about it? John yeah. Resco, so when I dropped out of high school, you know, in my, in my time, my time, if you dropped out of high school, you either did it because your family had no money, you had to support the family, you had no money, or else you were a juvenile delinquent. You're on the road to crime. There's no question of it. You know, you're on the road to crime. You're a JD, juvenile delinquent. So in my building, there was this extraordinary woman. I mean, wow. I, I wrote about her. I want her to have some glimpse of life you know, in, in, after death. Um, she was, I guess, I guess in those days they called her a blue star. She was an intellectual. And she read books, and she especially read Ulysses. And she, she, she I guess she, you know, her, husband, her husband was a painter and a, a teacher at uh, uh, Missouri High School. He was a principal. So, and, and she became my friend, and she invited me to her house, and there was a place, the first time I saw a home with books everywhere, books and paintings. I thought, what an extraordinary thing. That alone was great. That alone was great. And she started to tell me about books I should know about. Should we go to Paris? Have you read Rambo? And of course I had it. Uh, and and uh, all that stuff. I got, and then one day she said, you know, you're very isolated, Fred. You don't know people. You don't know anyone. You don't know anyone you know, who's an artist. I want to introduce you to someone. The long short is she brought me to Parkchester, which was again not it wasn't gray, it was it was beige. <laughs> <laughs> beige. 
claiming this guy, John Resto, and his wife, Anita. And they're paintings. And one I came out, a beautiful painting of garbage can, well, garbage pails, sort of tilted on an axis. They, not realistic, the realistic pail, but no atmosphere, no street scene. God. And I said, who did that? He said, I did. He made these marvelous paintings. He actually showed when he was in prison. He was in prison for 20 years, two of 20 years, 20. When he was 17, he, he had a wife and a child. He had been a merchant seaman. It was a high of depression. There was no money, no food on the table, nothing. And the older guy in the neighborhood, Lower East Side, where I am now, said to him, I know how to make some money, come with me. They went up to the Bronx, the Bronx, Hawaii went to the Bronx, I don't know understand, to hold up a grocery store. And the guy came up with, the guy who only came out with a bat, and John, the older guy said to John, take the pistol, shoot him. And the idiot did. He shot the guy and killed him. They were caught right out the door. The older man was given a death sentence. They were both given death sentences. The older man was uh, executed within six months. And Resco had three separate reprieves. But the last one was 40 minutes, 4-0, four 40 minutes of the electric chair. And Governor Roosevelt, then to become President Roosevelt, gave him a life sentence in Dannemora prison. In prison, he began to draw and to paint and to paint and to draw. Until finally, he literally painted himself, painted himself out of prison. People helped him. People loved his work. People loved him. And they got him out after 20 years. One of the people who signed on his behalf, saying he's a redeemed person who should be led to society, gave, one of them was Groucho Marx. Imagine that. But many, many, many people wrote letters on his behalf. I met him. We became friends. And since my father had left, I had no father, really. He became like my father. He was like my father. And it was a, a, that, that's that man. And I, I, and I wanted him, I also wanted, as I said before, to have the memory of these people have some, some hint of their, their, that they were alive, they were there, that they did this. And a marvelous man, extraordinary, brilliant man. Again, I learned, learned many things from books from him. You know, all, all kinds of things. You know, I, I saw African sculpture for the first time. He was a, how did he do it? I'll never understand. He was an expert on African sculpture. He had been in prison for 20 years. Such an expert. You remember the thing called $64,000 question? That show, that would seem like a lot of money then. 69 came by Starbucks coffee for 64. <laughs> $64,000 question. That was the big thing. You went from 4,000 to 8,000. And then you estimate every time the question got harder and harder. And then finally, you hit the jackpot with 64,000. Well, Rusko was on. Now, this, I still can't get over it. He was on as an expert of sculpture, African sculpture. He got as far as 8,000. Uh, and then he said a certain thing he touched and looked at. He said it was Benin. They said it wasn't, and he lost, and that was the end of that. But he had a little bit of money from it. But this is the kind of interesting guy. He was a fascinating, wonderful man. And uh, part of why I wanted that, that I say in that book, what I wanted to tell in that book was, was things like that, people like that in my life. Yeah. yeah. Please. So great. But you have to wait until it cools down. And then 
go over it sentence by sentence, word by word. That's why I'm, I'm a slow writer, perhaps, but I, and you have to really be honest with yourself. And you have to say, can I do better now? Can I make the sentence better? Can I, can I change this? One word will make a difference in the, in the, in the line. What's, what can I do with it? That's what I think you have to be careful about. You have to be very honest, very honest. Some people can't do it. Some people just love their work. I like to hear themselves talk like I am doing now. And, uh, and, and there's, there's no self-criticism. You know, some people are disastrously too self-critical, like earlier. He couldn't, he couldn't, he was afraid. He was afraid. He was afraid it wasn't going to be good enough as his first book. That's what he was afraid of. And everyone would say, oh, he did a great book, the second book, not so much. We, we, we're filled, filled with dread as writers and artists about reception. My last word about this, I promise you. Gauguin, Gauguin said, when you begin to make a drawing, hold the pencil loose. Wow, that's about everything. That's about everything. When you begin to make a drawing, write a story, do anything. Hold the pencil loose. Hold yourself loose. Don't think about who's over your head, who's watching you doing anything. Just breathe it and do it. And I think that's key, I think, to everything, to every enterprise. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know if, if and uh, to what extent poetry has figured in your creative life. What has poetry meant to you as a writer, and who do you read? Okay. Now, I'm really happy you asked that. As, as I'm happy you asked that because poetry is poetry is as important to me as painting. Poetry is major. Before, before years and years ago, before I even had a television, uh, the bane of my life, in a way, not really, but you know, uh, before I had television, I had a stack of books by my bed, all poetry. I read poetry before I went to bed. Poetry, poetry, because poetry is about the most interesting things for me in writing, what I want to see in writing. Concision, <coughs> precision, metaphor, excellence, a, a, a phrase that will change your disposition. So I'm crazy for poets. I still read poetry. My favorite poets, now I, I, now I, the drum roll, my favorite poets. <laughs> well, <coughs> Chaucer, Shakespeare, the sonnets, of course, uh, to move up the scale in time, uh, Yates, I just started reading Yates again last night. Last night, just decided, I don't know, I gotta read Yates again. It's a crazy feeling, it's a poem you want to read again. And I know that he's somehow very difficult, but I'm crazy, I'm William Carlos Williams. Whitman I'm, Whitman, I'm in love with. Everything about Whitman, everything about Whitman. Not every poem, lots of, a lot of it is wind, a lot of it is braggadocio stuff, a lot of it is just, you know, air. But when he's on, he's magic. And not only the poetry, but the fact that he did what he did, that out of nowhere, in this actual American wilderness, which we've so wilderness, 1855, not only did he write poetry, he radicalized it, he changed it. He changed it single-handedly. One person did that. And with his courage to do it, and the, and the, and the will to do it, and the intelligence to do it. And now we take him for granted. He's a poet, you know, he's an American poet, pro for democracy, blah, blah, blah. We don't understand. Look at the poets who are his contemporaries, Whittier, Longfellow, the course so called fireside poets, poets who families read at night uh, to their children, uh, Hiawatha, on the shores of Kichigumi, all those poems, right? That's the context of Whitman. The context of Whitman, polite poetry, bloodless poetry, nicely made poetry, charming poetry. He changed it. So Whitman, and, 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 and very much now, because I like the difficulty, I like poems that want me to have to learn something. So I love Wallace Stevens. I'm crazy for Wallace Stevens. You know, even, not every poem of every poet is great, but when they're all there, there's nothing like it. So poetry, I want to learn from poetry how to say the thing quickly and precisely and beautifully. That's what, that's what, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Let's take one more question. I think there was, yeah. Hi, uh, you, you mentioned, um, you described your uh, kind of reversal with your ideas about your own writing. I mean that your first book, instead of being autobiographical as so many first novels are, was a radical departure that seemingly had nothing to do with you. And now your latest book is, um, is more conventional uh, in terms of subject matter and also style. 
And also you talked about how your ideas about uh, writing has, has uh, about the writing you like has changed. Hemingway going from, you know, going down 80 points, um, Simenon going up. Uh -huh. And uh, you briefly mentioned uh, about um, Mr. Fischel's work that when you first, and David Sally, that when you first heard about these uh, artists, you thought, what are they doing? Um, and they're going back in time. And then, uh, and I know that you were an art critic for a long time, and so I was wondering about how your ideas about um, um, painting uh, has, yeah. has evolved. Yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself about this art critic. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wrote, uh, I was a stringer for a while for the New York Times when uh, Hilton Kramer was the uh, chief writer, the chief writer for the Times. And uh, uh, I, I had done that and I had been writing when I was in graduate school and I was getting my doctorate. I was so bored with school, I hated it so much, I just hated it. I felt so anonymous and so awful that I began to do art writing for an art magazine, now extinct, called art, Arts, A-R-T, Arts Magazine. And I invented myself, I just invented myself. I had no art, I had one class in art history at City College, a year worth of art history. But I just, I just did it. And I, I would go to the, uh, before even going to the galleries, I'd go to the artist studios to see the work because the lead time was six weeks for the, for the review in the magazine. So I went to see, guess who? Uh, Rauschenberg, Klaus Oldenburg, George Siegel, all the painters, all the artists of the curtain, and I began to write about them. And I don't know, I guess what I did, with my instinct, was to write about what I liked, which finally I think is what matters. I think that's what I think really matters. To tell them where the reader is, art, art reviewing I'm talking about. To tell the reader, I like this work for this reason. I think you might like it, go see it. It's the same with book reading. But I had also, I, I was very impressionable. I was very impressionable. I liked everything that was different, everything that was radical, everything that seemed so unusual. So, for example, when I went to the Venice Biennale, Hilton Kramer said, and this, is, this, is the, this is the strangest thing in the world. You know, sometimes you strive so hard to get something. You strive, you study, you do, and then you work so hard, you climb up the ladder hoping to get to that place. And sometimes you just walk into it. One day I was at a cocktail party. Hilton Kramer came over to me and said, you know, I don't want to go to Venice this summer. You want to go to the Venice Biennale? Huh? Yeah, sure, why not? So I went to the Venice Biennale to, to write for the New York Times Venice Biennale. I know that 3,000 people probably were hoping and dreaming they could do the same job. But I, I, there I was. And I started to get fascinated by an Argentinian artist. His work was uh, beehives. Not, 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 he had constructed a kind of world of plexiglass boxes and stuff where the bees lived. And they would zoom around and do stuff. I was enamored. I thought, wow, this is really hot stuff. And I wrote about the beehive work. I wrote about all the craziest stuff in the world, right? When I got back, about a week after I got back, I find in my mailbox a postcard from Hilton Kramer. Are you the same Frederick Tuckman who reviewed <laughs> the Venice Biennale show? Question mark. I thought it was more like cheerleading than it was art writing. I guess I was a cheerleader. But I, I, my feeling is a lot of the stuff I liked very early on, that I was committed to crazy for, I'm not interested in it anymore now. No. Uh, I, I made, a, I made a, almost an enemy very recently. I hope I don't alienate you all right now. When I said about uh, the sacrosanct Pollock, Klein, not Klein, it's Pollock, you know, Pollock and Pollock and others at all. And I thought, you know what, finally, to me it looks like wallpaper. I really don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I want to, I want now, at this time of my life, I guess that's why that book means so much to me, the memoir, I want to feel the life and blood of the person making it. I don't want, I don't want that. I, I don't believe that the drippings and all that stuff is really the life and blood of the artist. It's not. I don't believe it. It's nice. It's beautiful. It's attractive. You know what? No, when I came back and I saw Eric's work and David's work, especially those two, I thought, I reconsidered it. I thought, but there's something here that's, that's been missing all this time. We've been missing this. We've been missing feeling an art. Feeling, emotions, tension, mystery. When I saw Eric's early paintings, I thought, my God, this is wild. Who's ever done this? 
I still feel that way in both of them. There's something radically beautiful about them. And not just aesthetically beautiful, emotionally beautiful. I want that combination. I want that combination in art. I want that combination in life. I want the aesthetic and the emotional combined. I want that all the time. Enough of what I want. <laughs> should we say goodnight? I think we should say goodnight.